Hey, guys, you, you have your Bibles. I want you to turn with me back to Proverbs 19, chapter verse number 21. Proverbs 19, 21. We started on last week uh, with this series we're entitling Fulfilling Our Purpose. Fulfilling Our Purpose. Uh, and we, we said that there are three primary focal points that we're going to dial down on through this series. Uh, and um, the first thing we talk about is engage. Fulfilling our purpose requires us to engage. Everybody say engage. engage. It requires us to be equipped. Equipped. Everybody say equipped. Equip. And it, it, it requires us to be empowered. So we're going to talk about engage, equip, and empower. Now listen to me, guys. I told you on last week that I was going to deal with engage and then move to equip this week. But the Holy Spirit rested my spirit. Because, you know, I try to be sensitive. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit told me, and I need to try to unpack this first one a little bit more, what he told me was, is that people are reluctant to engage. Let me say that once more and again. What he told me says, he says, my people can be standoffish sometimes. Let me say it again. What he told me is, you got to go back and delve into the whys of why we are reluctant to engage. Are y'all with me today? We got we got to delve into that because the moment I start talking about engagement, the moment we start talking about connecting with people, some of y'all immediately start figuring out in your mind how I can skip that part. Somewhere in your mind, you start saying, well, you know, I, I, I like my church family, but I don't know if I want anybody from my church family coming over to my house. I, I love my brothers and I, and I, I go to Sunday school and I talk in small group with them, but I don't know if, I, if I'm ready to truly engage. And, I, I, and, and, and it was just as clear as day that that's been the problem with a lot of our churches and a lot of believers uh, unlike the early church in the book of Acts, the early church spent a, a great deal of time communing together. And guess what, guys? The majority of their time together was outside of the temple. And we have bought into the false concept that church is about gathering on Sunday morning. And what God is trying to get us to understand is that that's never been his intention for us is to come and stay in the church and have a good time in the church. Ooh, didn't we have good service? Ooh, rare preach. Ooh, the choir song. Ooh, Sister Sally shout it like she normally shouts. But we leave, guys, and we don't really truly engage one another. And I, I know I'm right about it because it hit me dead in my spirit. God says you got to unpack and, and get into some of these things as to the wise and get people to understand that if we're going to really be the kingdom agenda advancing church, the first thing we got to do is, is to engage. Amen? So we're going to deal a little bit with that again. Now, I told you on last week that we engage others through genuine relationships, sharing our lives and the gospel. Everybody say, Genuine relationship. That word genuine is underlined. Genuine means that it's real, it's authentic. I got to ask you a question. How many of y'all got some fake friends? And, and let me let me say that. I mean, let, let, let me let me clue y'all in. All of y'all are on Facebook. Ninety-nine point probably nine percent of your Facebook friends are fake friends. They ain't real friends. Okay, so don't get enamored. Because you got, oh, I, I got 5,000 followers. Anybody will follow you if you say something crazy. Can you get away with this? So, so, so all of us have probably experienced situations where we thought we had friends. So, so the social media friends aren't real friends because you, most of those folks you never connected with in person. I believe that, that, that over a period of time, you may start off by talking to somebody over the phone, but if you're going to have a genuine relationship, then I think it's going to mean that you got to come together and connect at some level outside of just the church. Because most of us know that when we come to church, guess what? We're on our best behavior most of the time, right? 
When we come to church, there are certain things and certain norms that we have in the worship service that, that, that sort of prohibit us from, 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 from acting the way we may act when we're at home. That's why some of y'all don't want nobody to come to your house, because so when you come to your house, you're, you're different there. Your little children are so confused. They see you lifting up holy hands, praising God, but then, but then when you're at home, you cuss your, you cuss your husband out. Hello? But you come up here and sing that song, I've been through too much. Nah, too. Guys, we got we to gotta get real. Engaging others through genuine relationships, sharing our lives and the gospel. Again, genuine relationships and sharing our lives. The Holy Spirit told me that scares a lot of y'all. And I, I'm going to be honest with you. That's a challenge for me, too, especially as a pastor. You know, I was reading an article several years ago and talked about pastors, and an and, uh, and, and, and overwhelming majority, probably about seventy percent of the pastors, could not name a true friend, somebody who who they could sit down and talk with, somebody who they could share their struggles with, uh, and somebody who they could could walk through life with. A lot of pastors don't have close friends. I know they got they got ministers, associates, but I'm talking about somebody who they got a genuine relationship with. They, sharing lives together and the gospel. So many of us are, are, are somewhat scared to do that because, you know, because of past experience. So our relationship, uh, we, we got to engage us through genuine relationships, sharing our lives and the gospel together. So genuine relationship, sharing lives is a part of engagement. And, and I don't need you to raise your hand, but I know some of y'all are afraid to do that. And here's why you're afraid to do that. You've been hurt before. Hello? You've been disappointed before. It's the same way as if a, if a young lady is dating a, dating a boy, okay? Or, or you, let, let's say, for instance, you've been married before, and then all of a sudden things happen and you get divorced, and then now maybe you've been divorced for 5, 10, 12 years, and now you meet somebody who you really like, who, who may be a God-honoring man who's loving God, following the edits of teaching, ain't trying to get, get under your skirt after one week of meeting you, he told you he's going to wait till you, till you all are married before he, he could consummate the marriage relationship. And, 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 but but and, and you got a good man there, but still in the back of your mind, you're still thinking about that bad relationship that happened 10 years ago. The dude that wasn't no good. Any, y'all, any ladies ever connected with a guy who wasn't any good? I need, I need one hand raised in here. I, I, need, I need to see some, some, somebody who says, I, perhaps I had one, I didn't know it. But I found out. Huh? Any of you brothers connected with a lady who wasn't, who wasn't what she seemed like on the outside? When you first met her, she was nice and sweet, cooked for you, didn't tell you that it was a mama's food. She went and got the food, brought over the house. Then once she married, you found out she can't even cook. But all of us, if we're honest about it, have been connected in the past with people who have hurt us, who have let us down. And so as a result of that, we're, we're somewhat skittish about this engagement thing. But guys, I'm here to tell you that as a born-again believer, this is critical to your spiritual development. And in, that in, is engaging, amen, others through genuine relationships and sharing our lives and the gospel together. Amen? And so, so our relationships should demonstrate, we told you on last week's steadfast commitment to Jesus and his word. And, 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 the, and the, uh, the, the next thing I want you to focus in on today is, which I really got to get to, because this, this, this is what I want to share with you. I won't finish all of it. I got some more to share with you on this, but I think we got to understand it, okay? Uh, many of us are afraid to engage because we don't understand relationship boundaries. And that's what I want to talk about. Many of us are afraid to engage because we don't understand and haven't been taught about relationship boundaries. Go to go to Proverbs chapter number nineteen, verse number twenty-one, and let's, let's look at that right there. We're going to jump into. I got to get back to. Can we talk about fulfilling our purpose? Think of what Proverbs nineteen and twenty-one says, and then we're going to look at Romans eight twenty-eight through thirty. Proverbs nineteen, verse number twenty-one, and then we'll get to Romans uh, eight. 28 through 30. It says, 
Now, again, Proverbs written uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Solomon, I believe, is the writer of Proverbs. Is that correct, Bible study? Okay. Solomon, the one who, who God endowed with infinite wisdom, wisdom uh, beyond the normal man. He writes this, he says, if you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. How many of y'all can say, I know that's true, Pastor. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Have you ever planned something and, and, and you had it all mapped out how it's supposed to go? And then the Lord said, oh, that, I ain't in that. <laughs> and then the Lord just caused that thing just to crumble and, and just fall apart because that wasn't here. He says, You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Let's go to uh, Romans 8, chapter, verse number 28, and we'll, we'll, we'll read there. Purpose, talking about fulfilling our purpose. Listen to me very carefully. Everybody who is here, if you are a born again believer, you have a divine purpose. God has gifted you. He loves you. He wants to use you to advance his kingdom agenda here in the earth. Can we get a witness? So, every one of us in here, I don't care who you are, where you come from, you have purpose. And because you have purpose, it meant God wants to use you to fulfill that purpose. Look at what it says. And we know, let's read together, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called what? According to his purpose for them. Next verse says what? Let's go. Um, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Next verse. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them what? Right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them what? His glory. That's what he did. He gave them his glory. Now, now guys, let, let's, so, so we understand he works everything together for the good of those who love the Lord to those who are called according to what? His purpose. So what that tells me, everything that's happening in my life, God is working it together, even my bad decisions. And how many of y'all got some of those like I do? Even my bad decisions, when I mess up and don't follow God, God will take that bad decision and the consequences of that bad decision and use it to shape me and to make me what he desires for me to be. Everything that happens in our life is available for God to utilize to advance his kingdom agenda. Now, let's, let's unpack a little bit. Boundaries. What about boundaries define us? You should have in your notes there. Boundaries define us. Things we need to know about boundaries. They define us. They define what is me and what's not me. A boundary shows me where I end and someone else begins, leading me to a sense of ownership. Boundaries define us. You know, you know we, we know about physical boundaries, right? You know, visible uh, property lines. You have a fence up. Uh, that surrounds your property. That's letting everybody know that that property belongs to you. And even if there's not a fence up, you can go down to the parish courthouse uh, and, and begin to look up a legal description that will give you the dimensions of property uh, in, in your area, in your town. It's a physical boundary. In the spiritual world, guys, boundaries are just as real as the physical boundaries that we encounter in our life. But they're often harder to see. So that's why we want to try to talk about it. The Bible tells us clearly what our boundaries are and how to protect them. But often, guys, our family, come on, how many of y'all, we just went through a series about me and my dysfunctional family, didn't we? All right? So he says, uh, uh, boundaries are, uh, the Bible tells us clearly what our boundaries are and how to protect them. But often our family, or other past relationships, I'm just talking about, confuse us about boundaries. How many of y'all ever had somebody who you used to date still has forgotten that it's used to date? Come on. They forgot it, that, that y'all used to date, and then now they're trying to cross the boundary. Now you got a new boyfriend, and then now they're still trying to move in. Oh, y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. Y'all act like I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a stupid up here. 
You have never had somebody who you used to date with, and then you run into them, and they try to still see if they can cross that boundary? I'm coming to this side. I think I got some genuine folk over here. You, you ain't had somebody who you used to be connected with, and now you're no longer connected with, and now they can't cross that boundary line. Because when they were, they were in that boundary, in that proper place, you could get them a kiss. But now that they are not inside that boundary, y'all are not dating, no kissing going on here. They're going to come up and try and hey, just, 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 just hug me tonight for old times' sake. No, 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 no old times' sake. Y'all, y'all, y'all trying to play me. That's somebody who don't understand boundaries. How y'all with me? Guys, listen to me. What we got to realize is the Bible tells us clearly what our boundaries are and how to protect them. But again, our family, our past relationships confuse us about our boundaries. Boundaries help us to define what we are responsible for and what we're not responsible for. Let me read that one again. Boundaries help us to define what we are responsible for and what we are not responsible for. Boundaries help us to define what we are responsible for, Mama, who's still taking care of your 40 year old son, and what you are not responsible for. Can I get a witness up in here? So, guys. We, 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 got it. We, got, we got to get to the, to, to the point where we understand this. We are responsible to others and for ourselves. Let me say it again. We are responsible to others and for ourselves. Let me unpack it for a second. Go to Galatians, Galatians the 6th chapter, and we're going to begin our reading at verse number 1. We are responsible to others and for ourselves. Galatians chapter number 6. And we're going to begin our reading at verse number one. Let's read together out loud on purpose. Ready to read. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou what? Also be tempted. Next verse says what? Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 3, let's read. For if a man seeks himself to be something when he is nothing, he what? Deceiveth himself. Next verse. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Verse number 5. For every man shall do what? Bear his own burden. Now watch this, guys. Let, let, let me, let, let, let's drill down on, on, this, on this verse right here. I'm, I, I'm going to I'm going to read uh, that one more time, but I'm going to go to the New Living Translation because I think it just unpacks the living better for us. He says in verse one from the NLT, "Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens." And this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you're too important to help someone, anybody out there, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are not that important. Come on, come on look at me now and say, neighbor, you are not that important. For 45, watch this, watch this, y'all. Pay careful attention to your own work for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. All of y'all out there that's going around comparing yourself to somebody else, that ain't your job. If you're going to compare yourself to anybody, compare yourself to Christ. More people get themselves in trouble by comparing, amen, themselves to the Jones or the Smith. I want what they got. You don't come out and say that, but you go and get what they got. I am comfortable in my own skin. I, I thank God that can't nobody beat me being dull out because I'm dull out. And you, when you learn to, 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 to appreciate who God made you to be 
and, and you're willing to transform into the image of God's Son, then you're going to, you, all this comparison stuff got to go out the window. Can I get a witness? Look at verse number five. Watch, verse five, watch it. For we are each responsible for our what? For our own conduct. Now, guys, uh, who said, for we are responsible to others and for ourselves. Verse two of that, of, of that, of that passage, verse two shows our responsibility to one another. Many times, others have burdens that are just too big to bear, which y'all agree. They don't have enough strength, enough resources, uh, enough knowledge, enough skill set, enough word in them to bear some of those burdens, and they need our help. That's why we are our brother's people. Now, denying ourselves to help those folks, uh, uh, that, 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 that's actually showing the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. That's what he did for us, right? He did what we could not do for ourselves. In other words, we couldn't save ourselves. So Christ Jesus did it for us. That, 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 that means we're being responsible to that person. And on the other hand, verse 5, if you go back to verse 5 of this, of this passage, watch this again. Because we said we are responsible to others and for ourselves. We are responsible, everybody say, to others and for ourselves. That's critical. Because if you're not careful, a person who doesn't understand boundaries will make you think that you're responsible for them. They'll make you think that you're responsible to feed them, to take care of them. Now, we are, we are to help when somebody gets in the time of need, but if somebody, if you don't have proper boundaries, you'll have people who, who, who virtually will just be using you to do what they're supposed to be doing for themselves. I need somebody, I, can, can, can anybody witness to what I'm talking about? When people don't understand boundaries and you don't understand what you're responsible for and what you're responsible to, amen, then we get it all mixed up. For we are each responsible, verse 5 says, for our own conduct. Amen. Each one of us should carry our own burden. Everyone has responsibility that only he or she can carry. The Greek words, watch it, the Greek words for burden and load give us insight into the meaning of this text, guys. Uh, the Greek word for burden means excess burdens or burdens that are, that are so heavy, so big that you can't carry by yourself. Now, I want to, I want to, I want to, real quickly, I want to, I want to shoot down something that we've said for a number of years that's really not biblical. How many of y'all ever heard this statement? The Lord won't put no more on you than you can bear. How many of y'all heard that before? How many of y'all have said it before? You know, the Lord won't put no more on you than you can bear. That's not true. That's a, listen, that's why you need the Lord. If, if, if nothing came upon us that we weren't able to bear, we wouldn't even need the Lord. There is some stuff, guys, that will happen in your life that you can't get through it by yourself. There are things that will be going on and transpiring in your life that, that you're going to need the Lord's help to carry. So don't go around saying the Lord won't put no more on you than you can bear. Oftentimes in life, we get stuff that's put up on us that, that will just crush us, except that we have somebody who comes alongside to help us. And that's why we need each other, guys. We need each other. The Lord, the Lord knows that there are things that we can't handle. And, and, and you know why he does that? It's because man would be so prideful that he thinks he got it. He can handle it by himself. We, we got, and especially men. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about mankind in general. Men can be prideful. Men can be on a walker, bent over, with his back in excruciating pain, and they walk in and you try to help them. To, nah, I got it. I got it. Because we are prideful. We don't want anybody to help us. We think that's, it, it does sometimes manhood. In actuality, it's foolishness because there are times in life you need another shoulder to lean on. So I beg to differ. There will be times in your life where things will come on you that you need somebody else to help you carry that burden. Obviously, the Lord. But guess what? God also says we have a responsibility. Go back, go back to Galatians 6, verse 1 right quick. 1 and 2. Look at what it says here. Watch this. 
Dear brothers, if another believer is overcome by some sin, what are you supposed to do? Go and talk about him, right? No. He says what? You who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right track. Help that person back onto the right path. The person who's been overcome by some sin. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. So, 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 so share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. It says share what? Each other's burden. That's why you got to look at the difference. We said one Greek word means uh, it, it, it's like a boulder. It's something that's real heavy that you can't carry by yourself. But in verse 5, guys, he talks the word for burden here is it's, it's like a, a daily toll, a light load. He says, for we are each responsible for our own conduct or our own burden. It's, it's kind of like a backpack. There's, there's a difference between a boulder and a backpack. You know what a boulder is? A big old rock that may weigh 2,000 pounds. How many of y'all can pick up 2,000 pounds? Let me see if a, hand, a person can pick up 2,000 pounds. If you raise your hand right now, the is going to strike you dead. Some of y'all can't pick up 20 pounds. How many of y'all can get in the weight room right now and with the bar and 245 on each side? I think that's, if I remember correctly, it's my weightlifting days, but it might, that's probably 145 pounds. How many of y'all can get up on that and pop 145 pounds? I got one. I got two, I got three. But some of y'all, I ain't going to lie, Pastor. I ain't going to raise my hand. See, there are some things in life, God, that are a little bit too heavy for us. And God says, listen, I, I designed you as a human being to connect and engage with other people in general relationships so they can help you when you're in one of those times where you got a burden that is too heavy for you to bear. God says, I'm here to help you, but I also have people here in the earth realm that I want you to connect with who can help you to carry that load. So we are to share one another's burden. When that person falls into sin, amen, we ought to go and get them. And again, uh, one, one thing that we got to realize is that, is that there, there's some stuff that, that we, we don't want to get mixed up because if there's something that we need help to bear, we need to get that help. But there are certain things that we need to be able to bear ourselves. And we can't we can't expect our fellow man to do that for us. Now watch this. Listen to me. If you're in need and are falling on hard times and need some food to eat, baby, I'm going to be the first one to help you with food to eat. Are y'all with me today? But if you are able-bodied, able to work, got good sense, you can't come to me every day for me to feed you. That's not my responsibility. That's the burden that you got to bear. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at the scripture later on. The Bible says, if a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. That's a, that's, that's a burden of, of, that, that you as an uh, able-bodied man have to bear yourself. Can I get a witness? So, so, so there are things that, that we need others to help us with. Certainly we need God to help us with everything. But there are things that we have to carry by ourselves. That fifth verse says, Every man got to bear their own burden. Verse 2 says we got to have to help that person bear their burden. That boulder, that thing that's so heavy, whether it's depth in the family, whether it's whatever loss, loss of you know, a loved one through divorce, whatever. Whatever the situation is, sometimes we need somebody else to walk alongside with us, right? To help us do that. And that's why we need genuine relationship. But here's the thing. A lot of us don't want to enter those genuine relationships because guess what? We've been hurt before. Our families have hurt us. Past relationships have, have dealt with a, a blow. So we're reluctant to engage. But God says, if we're going to fulfill our purpose, there are no long ranges in the body of Christ. we got to learn how to get over our fear of engaging with people, okay? So we're, we're, we're you know, some of the things, you guys, we got to realize that we are expected to deal with our own feelings, our attitudes, and our behaviors, as well as our, the responsibility that God has given us given to each one of us, even though it takes effort on our part. we gotta be, we got to be responsible for that. Guys, we have problems when people act as if their boulders are like backpacks and their backpacks are like boulders. We have a problem when people, when people refuse help because of their pride or when people, all they do is want help because they don't want to carry their own burden. And that's where we get mixed up. That's when those, those boundaries get out of whack 
And I've seen it happen before, time and time again, where husband and wife will get into arguments uh, about proper boundaries as it relates to grown children or as it relates to uh, uh, helping parents or helping in-laws, uh, you know, mother-in-law, father-in-law, whoever, but they get into arguments and they, and they cannot uh, get past it because they hadn't understood proper boundaries. One thing we learned when we went through our men's study is, is this, uh, here's what happens a lot of times in our, in our families where that we have these father wounds and these overly bonded with mother wounds. And it, it, this happens quite a bit when, especially if there's, if there's only one child or two children, uh, sometimes uh, that child can't disconnect from the mama or the daddy and, 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 and give the proper relationship priority to their relationship with their husband and their wife, with their, with their spouse. In other words, guys, once you become united in marriage, then your relationship with your spouse actually trumps your relationship with your, with your parents. Let me say it again. Your relationship with your spouse takes priority over mama's relationship. The Bible says, therefore shall a man, what? Leave his father and mother and do what? Cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become what? One flesh. That leaving involves separating physically, emotionally, and financially. Watch this, guys. Watch this. If you don't understand boundaries, then your mama or your daddy will guilt trip you into doing things, amen, far beyond what you are really supposed to do. I hope I'll help with somebody. Now again, we do, we do understand that the Bible teaches us that, that if, if there's a widow who's in deed, then the church should help that widow who's in deed. But if there's a widow who has children, grown children, come on, then it's the responsibility that grown children does help mama, amen, in her old age. So I'm balanced here, but what I'm dealing with is, is when that umbilical cord hasn't been cut and you don't have proper boundaries and you allow your relationship with your, with your mom, your dad, or your brother, sister to take precedence over your relationship with your spouse. Everybody said that's out of order. Amen. So, and, and the reason why it gets out of order is because we don't understand proper boundaries. Amen. So, 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 so boundaries, guys, this is boundaries, number five, boundaries help us keep the good in and the bad out. They help us to guard our heart with all diligence. Let's look at what Proverbs 4 and 23 says. Watch this. What Proverbs chapter number 4, verse number 23. Boundaries help us to keep the good in and the bad out. How many of y'all know you need some boundaries in your life? The text says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your, of your life. Stuff that's on the inside of us, amen, sinful stuff comes from our heart. That's why I told you before, don't just follow your heart because your heart got some stuff in it that, especially if the Holy Spirit hadn't came and filled you, your heart will have you going in a direction that you should not go with. Why it says, guard your heart, for it determines the course of your life. Go to Matthew the seventh chapter, verse number six, right quick. Look at, watch this, watch this, guys. So, so, so we, we're going to look at some examples of boundaries here in just a second. But I, I got to share these scripture with you. Matthew the seventh chapter, verse number six says what? Don't waste what is holy on people who are what? Unholy. This is Jesus talking about. Watch this. Read it with it out loud on purpose. Because some of y'all are wasting time with folk who, are, who ain't, I'm going to say it like you said, from the country, ain't bit most of the Lord. I know it's kind of colloquial phrases there. And I know it's not grammatically correct, but I'm going to say it again because it sounds good. They ain't bit most of the Lord. You over there sweating, arguing, fussing, fighting, trying to throw pearls of wisdom. They're not, they get saved first. Come on, you, you spend all that time. And look at what Jesus says. Don't waste what is holy on people who are what? 
Don't throw your pearls to what? Pigs. They will do what? They will trample the pearl, then turn and attack you. Some of y'all know this truth. You still been trying to tell them what the Lord done in your life and how did to turn their life over to the Lord and got to do this and you got to do that. And they sitting there ain't studying you. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't witness to people, but but we, we, we waste an awful lot of time trying to label with folk who are unholy, unrighteous, and have no desire for the things of God. Hello? We ought to build a relationship with people, but what I'm telling you is, you're trying to, how, how are you going to give a scripture to somebody who ain't even saved? They can't understand it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that the things of God are spiritually discerned. You quote scripture to somebody who ain't even saved. Don't mean anything to them. If you quote scripture to an atheist, what's they going to do to him? He doesn't believe in the Bible. See, the Word of God, amen, is true to those who believe it is the Word of God. And that's what the enemy is after, guys. The enemy is attacking the authenticity of the Word of God. So, Because he knows if he can distort the Word like he did with Eve in the Garden of Eve. Y'all remember that, right? Yea, hath God said Eve. He's after the Word. So stop wasting your time throwing words of wisdom and pearls of wisdom uh, uh, to folk who are unholy, unsaved. You, you pray for them, you love on them, but you, how are you going to have a Bible study with somebody who doesn't even believe the Bible? I'm just trying to help somebody. Oh, that's being mean, Pastor. I, I just believe, I just, listen, listen, I didn't say you don't have a relationship with him. I said, Jesus says, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. How many of y'all believe God's word is holy? It is. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. He said, what, what are they going to do? They're going to trample the pearls and do what? Turn around and attack you. And you've seen that happen in your own life. Can I get away with it? Are y'all, are y'all grasping what I'm saying here? So boundaries help us to keep the good in the bad out. Now, the concept of boundaries, guys, comes from the very nature of God. He defines and takes responsibility. Watch this. And takes responsibility for his personality by telling us what he thinks, what he feels, what he plans, what he allows, what he would not allow, what he likes, and what he dislikes. Go to 1 John 1, verse 5 to 7. Fulfilling our purpose. Talking about engaging. The reason why we don't engage is because we have, a, in a lot of cases, understood proper bound, relationship boundaries, and we allow people to get into our boundary space that they, they should never be in that space. Or we allow people to, to control and manipulate us because we, we, didn't, we didn't even know how to say no. How many of you ever struggle with saying no? I'm going to raise my hand. I'm not saying, I'm saying struggle with saying no to good stuff. It's not, it's not bad or evil stuff, but, 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 but if, you don't, if you don't learn how to say no, which again, those, your word, that word no is a good boundary word. It, it, it'll, it'll keep some things out, out, of your, out, of your, out, out of your property line that shouldn't be there. Watch what the text says here. Are y'all with me? Let's read. It says what? This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is what? Now here, here, here he is. John is describing God, God, who God is and what he's not. God is what? Is light. And there is what? No darkness in him at all. So anytime you see darkness, darkness is equated to sin. So if you see somebody walking in darkness, they're not walking in fellowship with God. I didn't say they weren't necessarily saved, because sometimes saved folk can do some dark stuff. Are y'all listening to me? You, you say born again, but if your mind is not right, you ain't prayed up, studied up, and filled with his Holy Spirit, you do some dark stuff. Look at what he says. Next verse, read. So we are lying. Listen, listen. Y'all got to read this with me. Come on, online, I'll just read it with me. Say what? So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God, but go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. Look at what he says. We lying. If we say, oh, I know God, I know God, I know I'm saved, I'm, I'm walking with God. Now, listen, you can be saved but not be in fellowship with God. 
The Corinthian church had a problem with that. They were spiritual babies. They were, they were saved, but they were doing some ungodly stuff. And guys, God can't use you to advance kingdom principles. He can't use you to fulfill your purpose if you're, if you're not in fellowship with him. Anytime somebody's walking in darkness, they're not in fellowship with God. I don't care what they say. Verse number seven reads, says what? But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So let's just look at some examples of boundaries. Boundaries are anything that helps to differentiate you from someone else or shows where you begin and what you end. First thing is our, our own skin. The most basic boundary that defines us is our physical skin. Our physical self is the first way that we learn that we are separate from others. Even as a young baby, when you, when you come to this world, you begin to realize over a period of time that, hey, I'm, 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 not, I'm my own person. And see, our, our skin actually keeps all of our organs and stuff covered, right? Our skin wraps up. It, it protects us from stuff that's coming in from the outside. If you think about it for a second, how many of how many other saw in science class or biology class saw one of those maps that showed all your muscles, your guts, your organs, and all that kind of stuff? Anybody? Do y'all remember that? See, what, what if all of us were walking around with no skin? Man, we would, we would, we would be sub, sub, subject to all kinds of sickness and disease. It would, it would, it would, be, it would be just a, a dastardly situation. But just our own physical self is a boundary. The next thing is our words. Again, the, uh, the, the most basic boundary-setting word is no. People with poor boundaries, hear me, struggle with saying no to the control, the pressure, and sometimes real needs. The pressure to demand sometimes real needs of others. Am I, am I the only one that has had trouble saying no to that? I mean, now again, when I say, saying no, that means... Let me, let, me ask, let me give you just a perfect illustration. It's not a bad thing. Oftentimes, I'm asked to serve on, on board of directors for nonprofit organizations. Simply because of my banking background and because I'm a pastor of the church and, and I've connected with people over the years. So oftentimes, I'm asked to serve on boards. Um, and and, and those, are, those, those organizations are doing some great things. And I love serving. But one night I found myself almost every week and sometimes twice, I mean, two or three times a week going to board meetings, doing good stuff. But the time to travel from Bend to Shreveport to meet and travel back, and then you do it two, two times a week, sometimes three times a week, then all of a sudden, it's, it's encroaching on my time and my ability to get my work done here as a pastor and a business administrator. So even though those, those, those board assignments were good things to do, but because I had trouble saying no, I looked up one day and found out I was on seven boards at one time. And that wasn't good. Because if I'm given a little piece here, a little piece there, and then it's pulling me away from what I'm doing here, then because I didn't, I, because I felt like it was good stuff, it was needful things that were being done in the community, but I sat there and I, 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 somehow I just couldn't say no. But I've learned Everybody say, pastors learn. I've learned that there are times when you got to say no to good stuff. There are times you got to say no to even godly stuff. I say godly stuff. Say, for instance, in ministry, you can spread yourself too thin. And now you just, you're just running on fumes, amen, because you, you don't, you know, you, you got too much going on. So learn how to focus. Watch what, watch what uh, Matthew 5 and 37 says. Let's go to Matthew 5, verse number 37. Glory to God. Matthew 5, verse number 37 says what? Jesus, just say, just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Jesus said, let your yes be yes, and your no be no. How many of y'all have ever said no? That I, well, I, I don't know. I, I think about it. Don't say you think about it. If you know you can't do something, just say, I, I push you the opportunity, but no, I can't do it at this time. All right? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Learn how to, to say no to things that, that's going to stretch you to the point to where you're not, amen, serving God the way you should. So learning that is, is really important because many people don't, don't know how to say no to mama, don't know how to say no to daddy, don't know how to say, don't know how to say no to your sister or whoever. And really, and sometimes we end up, we end up hurting them 
rather than helping them. Everybody said we end up hurting rather than helping. Because they got some stuff they got to deal with, but you come in and rescue them every time they, they, they get outside their, their boundaries and mess themselves up. Amen? So, so words. The, the, the other example of boundaries is truth. Knowing the truth about God and His property puts limits on us and shows us His boundary. Shows us His boundary. John 8 and 32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Go to Psalms 119, verse number 2. Psalms 119, verse number 2. Watch this, guys. It says this, joyful, watch this. Joy, read with me. It says, what? Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him, what? With all their hearts. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. Go to verse number 45 with me right quick. Joyful of those who obey his laws and search for him with all the heart. Maybe you're not joyful because you're not obeying his laws and you're not searching with all your heart. Verse 45 says what? I will walk in freedom for I have devoted myself to your what? Commandments. How many of y'all can honestly say that I've devoted myself to his commandments? Now listen, guys. That's what we got to get to. If you can't honestly say it, we got to get to the point where we can honestly say it. I'm devoting myself to obeying His commandments. That brings freedom. Knowing the truth and applying the truth sets us free. So the, the, the next boundary here is physical distance. Everybody say physical distance. All right. Go, go with me, if you will, uh, to um, sometimes physically removing yourself from a situation will help maintain boundaries. Watch what, uh, let, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 through 13, and then we'll look at 1 Corinthians 6, chapter verse number 18. Boundaries, physical distance, can help you keep, amen, yourself uh, in proper engagement with somebody. Look at what Paul says as he writes to the church at Corinth. He says, I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people, don't even eat with such people. Verse number 12 says what? It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are what? Look at what it says. It isn't my responsibility to judge the world, those outside, but it certainly is my responsibility, our responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Look at the next verse. Watch this. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove physical distance the evil person from among you. Y'all who know this story here, or this text, not story, in this fifth chapter, there was a guy in the church at Corinth who was sleeping with his stepmama, having sex with his stepmama. And the church knew about it and didn't do anything about it. I like what Brother Tim said. He says, this guy here had already spiritually separated himself from fellowship with God. And what Paul was calling on the Corinthian church to do was to, to, to do what he had already done spiritually, do it physically. Remove him from among you so that he would realize the error of his ways and repent. Now go to 1 Corinthians 6, chapter verse number 18. Here's one that we got to really keep in mind. 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 18. Watch this guy. Physical distance is a boundary that we need to learn. He says, says, watch this. Everybody read. He says, what? Read it again. Read it again. Run from sexual sin. Notice what he says. He didn't say pray through it. Hello. He didn't say, well, you know, just just you you and the guy, just y'all get together and y'all have a prayer meeting. No. He says, run from sexual sin. Separate yourself. Create a boundary. I was talking to a friend of mine this other day, and he said, uh, 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 he, he's single. He said this lady had uh, invited him to, uh, to, to, you know, to, to go out of town with him. Um, and, uh, you know, he's, he's a man of God. And, uh, and when she, she got around to ask him to take her out of town, he said he told this lady, he said, now, you know, and I 
I know what's going to happen if we go out of town together. She told me we'll get separate rooms. You know, we're going to go to this, this city here. We're going to separate rooms. She said, now you and I both know. I don't care if you do try to fool yourself into thinking that ain't nothing going to happen. Young ladies, young men, if you, you date somebody and that person wants to come over your house and your mom and dad is not there, I mean, creep a little bit closer. I'm keeping my physical distance. They say, well, just let me come back. I just want to say hi, say hi on the phone. Hello? Because you know yourself and you know that person. The last time y'all were together and the songs were playing, things got a little heated. I said things got a little heated, if you know what I mean. Heavy petting. Am I helping somebody up in here? Oh, let, 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 let's, let's remove the boyfriend and the girlfriend. You married. She married. Y'all talking. Y'all like the conversation. Things ain't going right at home. Cousin won't ever, he won't talk. All he do is grunt and watch football. He used to talk to you when he was trying to get you. Now he got you, he won't even talk. I don't know what to say. I can't speak. No, you knew what to say when you were trying to get them. Or vice versa. Now you talk, you at work, this person, amen, on their best behavior, they communicate, they laugh at your little sale jokes. You go to lunch together, then all of a sudden, here's when you know things starting to cross the boundary line. You start figuring out ways you can run into that person. Huh? I got to go down to the, to, 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 to the, to the apartment over here. I got to go pick something up. And then you go over and say, y'all, y'all, did a package come in for me? And you go right by Sarah's desk. Because now you're trying to get in front of Sarah. And then all of a sudden, what, what, what begins to happen after that is, you're trying to figure out a way you can run into Sarah and y'all are by y'all sales. Everybody say, set up. Say it again, say, set up. Say it again, say, set up. Look at what Paul says here when it comes to sexual sin, sexual immorality, all you tongue-talking, Bible-thumping, born-again believers. You better, here's what you better do. You better run. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, and and, and I'm going to tell the truth. I don't trust my flesh. And you better not trust yours either. I don't trust my flesh, so I put up boundaries. I, I think I will here. I, I don't trust my flesh, and you better not trust yours. So given the right situation, the right scenario, the right time, every last one of us in here are subject to falling in sexual sin. I think I'll say that once more again. Every one of us in here, given the right scenario, right situation, are subject to falling in the sixth sin. So that's why Paul says, run from it. Put the boundary up, physical distance. No other sin clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. And God, it's happened too many times to count. So physical distance is, 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 a, is a boundary, example of a boundary. Time. I mean, taking time off from a person or a project can be a way of regaining ownership over some out of control aspect of your life where boundaries need to be set. Sometimes you need, a, you need, you need some time, some, some time to yourself. Emotional distance. I mean, emotional distance is a temporary boundary to give us, give our hearts the space it needs to be safe. It's never a permanent way of living. We need to be always emotionally connected because if you're not careful, you can get to the point to where you disconnect emotionally. Well, you don't let it move you now. So that's why I'm saying this is not something that should be done permanently. But sometimes, especially you, how many of y'all have been in a toxic relationship before? Don't even raise your hand. I know you want, I know you want to be embarrassed. But you've been in a toxic relationship before. I mean, crazy stuff be happening. Slashing tide, bust the window out your car. I know 
us a little bit of old school song. You dating somebody who's, who's, who's slicing your tires. You dating somebody who's robo-calling you, and they don't have one of those machines to call you. They just, they just, just incessantly calling you. You need a break from that kind of person. That's a fatal attraction. Emotional distance is, is, is necessary. In fact, and, and, and other people are bound. Listen, we need to depend on others to help us to set and keep boundaries. Two reasons why. Number one, first, our most basic need in life is for relationship. That's why I'm trying to tell us we can't run from engagement, but understand how to put bound, physical bound, you know, proper boundaries in place so that we can engage properly with each other. And second thing is, we need new input and teaching. We need others to pour into our lives because we don't know everything. Hear me carefully. We don't know everything. And so when we connect with each other, then you impart wisdom into me and I impart wisdom into you and we help each other grow. And lastly, consequences are boundaries. How many of y'all know trespassing on other people's property carries consequences, right? You could get shot. The Bible teaches this principle over and over saying that if we walk one way, this will happen. If we walk another way, something else will happen. Last verse, last two verses we're going to read, we got to go. Watch this. Look at uh, Proverbs 16 and 26. Proverbs 16 and 26. We're talking about boundaries. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you next week, we'll talk about some laws of boundaries. Because I want you to understand this, and then we're going to move to equipping. Because if you learn how to uh, have proper relationship boundaries, then you'll be less afraid to engage with people. You, you, you'll be able to say, if somebody's trying to come to your house every Saturday, and eat dinner with you every Saturday, you, and you, you don't have to eat Saturday dinner either. Then you learn and say, well, no, not, not this weekend. Some of y'all can't say that. Well, you know, they say they want to come, and I want to be like Jesus. See that boundary? You don't think he did? Look in the scriptures. There were times when Jesus got away from the crowd. He had to get along by himself. Some of y'all let folks weigh you out. And then you'd be mad that they wear you out, but you're the one who keeps saying yes when you could just say, no, not this time. Am I helping somebody? It's good for workers to have an appetite and empty stomach to do what? Drive them on. This is talking about if you, if you want to work, there's consequences for not working. An empty stomach does what? Drives them on. Second Thessalonians 3 and 10. Y'all know this one. I think Second Thessalonians 3 and 10. Watch this. Even while we're with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work would not get to eat. In, in this situation right here, it, there were people who were waiting on the rapture to come. They quit their job. They said, we're waiting on Jesus. They didn't eat everybody else's food. And Paul says, I was told you before, and I'm saying it again, you know, they waiting around on the rapture to come, but if man won't work, don't feed him. Hello? That's the bound that you got to put up. So they'll keep eating your food if you keep feeding them. Guys, listen to me carefully. God wants us to engage. We were designed as human beings to engage with each other. Let's, let's learn how to, to, to and we're going to learn, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about proper relationship boundaries next week because I, I need you to understand this. This church, y'all, y'all are a blessing. I promise you, you are. But the one thing that I see that we're missing is, is, is more engagement in genuine relationship. And in the month of October, we, 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 we finish up the Kingdom Discipleship uh, uh, lessons uh, in, in the next week. In the month of October, we're going to give opportunities to apply some of the things that we learn. And that involves engaging, connecting with somebody who may not be just like you, so connecting with somebody who, uh, who, who maybe, you know, have, you know, do things differently than you. But God says, let's engage in genuine relationship. It will help us to fulfill our purpose. Jesus understood this. He fulfilled his purpose. He knew that he came to die on God God's hill for you all, you, you and I. He knew that, that, that he came to, 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 to die a sacrifice of death for the sins of God's people. He hung, bled, and died, bar- was buried in the bar tomb, resurrected the third day morning with all power, and heaven and earth in his hand because he understood his purpose 
and he understood how to engage. He engaged those disciples. And through their ministry, you and I are saved. Aren't you glad that he engaged them and didn't give up on them when they, when they did some raggedy old stuff? How many of the disciples did some raggedy stuff? They just had to get on them. But thank God he engaged them, stayed with them, nurtured them, and set them on a course to minister and to share such that you and I are saved because of somebody told us about Jesus, who told them about Jesus, who told them about Jesus, who go all the way back to the disciples who told them about Jesus. Let's engage so we can fill our purpose. Fill our purpose. Give me a dolly right here. God, we thank you for this time and this opportunity. We thank you for your word. God, we ask you to help us. Help us, God, to not be fearful of engaging in genuine relationship and doing and sharing life together. That's what we have to, God. And Lord, I, 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 I'll admit, like everybody in here, you probably listen to the sound of my voice. There have been times, God, we've been a little bit reluctant to engage because of what we saw happen in years past. But that is not an excuse not to do this, God, because you called us to engage with others because we draw strength from each other. Help us, God, to fulfill our purpose and learn how to set proper relationship boundaries so that we can closely and fully engage with those who you set our heart and mind to engage with. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Now listen to me. If you listen to to me here in this sanctuary or via live stream, and you cannot recall a time when you've ever invited Christ into your heart to save you, the first thing that you got to do in order to really effectively engage people um, is, to, is, to, is to be engaged with Jesus Christ yourself. So if you cannot recall a time when you invited Christ to come into your heart to save you, and you did that and you meant that, and it, and it transformed your life, then I want to give you that opportunity right now. It's simple. Realize that you're lost and need to be saved. And just say, Lord Jesus, I realize I'm lost and I need to be saved. I invite you to come into my heart and save me. I believe that you died on Calvary's Hill. You were buried and you resurrected the third day morning according to what the Scripture teaches and right now, I invite you into my heart to save me. I don't understand it all, but I just trust that you can do it, that you will save me. Come into my heart. And if you did that, listen, and you meant it, God will come in and take a resident in your heart. So now, the first commandment of obedience, I said, is baptism, and unite with a Bible teaching church. And so, if you made the decision, we want to hear from you. We want to be able to support you in the decision. So, text, email, information will come at the end of the, of the, of the service. It will tell you how to connect with us and let us know about that decision. We, we, we want to celebrate with you. Glory to God. Now listen. Here's the next appeal. Listen to this carefully. If you here in this sanctuary and you know, you say, Pastor, man, I, you, know, you, 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 you were reading my mail this morning. Because I, 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 I'm a little bit skittish about engaging with people who I don't know. And that's the whole point of evangelism. That's the whole point of disciple making is if you engage with people who you may not know at the time that you engage. But once you engage them, you will know them. But maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I, 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 I have trouble with that. Now, I, I want you to stand on your feet. I want to pray with you right now. Come on. Real, real quickly. You, you that are uh, in your home, stand on your feet. You say, Pastor, you know, I, I, I know engagement is important. Genuine relationships. Sharing life together. But I've been a little bit hesitant about sharing my life. I don't let people get too close to me. If that's you, hey, I feel you. I, I, I know the feeling. But that's not, that's not helpful for us. God, God wants us to, he wants us to engage. I, come on now, be honest with yourself now. If you, you know you struggle with that or maybe you, you've had some hesitation about engaging in genuine relationships sharing and doing life together because of maybe past hurt, family of origin issues, I want you to stand on your feet. I want to pray with you. You that are be, be in live stream, stand right where you are. And I want everybody to reach your hand toward the altar. You that are watching, do the same thing. Let's pray right now. Father, we thank you 
and praise you for this divine opportunity. God, we ask you to help us. We know you created us to commune with other human beings. You created us to engage with others. And Lord, we're going to be honest. There's, there are times, God, where we, we're, we're, we're somewhat re- uh, uh, reluctant to do so. But Lord, we ask you to strengthen us and give us a passion, a strong desire to connect with our fellow church members and others who, who can help us to grow in our faith. Thank you right now, God, for this divine opportunity. For we love you, God, and we praise you. And Lord, we ask you to just anoint us from the crown of our head to the soles of our feet. Give us the wisdom to know how to do relationships properly. For Lord, sometimes we don't understand, we don't know. But we know that through your word, you'll teach us. And we thank you right now. And God, we receive your Holy Spirit into our hearts right now. We receive your power. We thank you. And we lift you up. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and claim the victory. All the agreements say it, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. God bless you. Bless you, bless you.